Hello guys, today I'm making a new video, the second video about the rear suspensions of mountain bikes. In this video I will cover in more detail the forces and progressivity of the, the suspension. So in my first video I explain you that the rear suspension of a mountain bike uh, has a leverage, there is a leverage ratio between the rear, rear wheel uh, travel and the shock compression. In this case, the stone and the force of the man. So, for bigger levers, uh, it's it easy to compress the, the suspension or to lift the rock. At the first video, I, I told you that the leverage ratio, uh, the average, the global leverage ratio, is the ratio between the wheel travel divided by the shock stroke. As a matter of example, imagine that you have two bikes with 170 millimeters of travel, so a free, a free ride bike, uh, and both bikes use a 57 millimeter stroke uh, in the shock. Uh, so both bikes will have a leverage ratio on average of three. The first, the first bike, the bike A, uh, is a linear bike, and the, it has a, a constant uh, leverage ratio along the travel. The second bike, the bike B, is a progressive bike. In this case, it starts with a 4 of, of, of ratio and it decreases until 2 of leverage ratio. So this is an extremely progressive bike. But uh, both bikes on average have a leverage ratio of 3. Um, we'll, we will we'll add a coil shock to these bikes just for simplicity. In this case, we have a coil shock with a 500 uh, pounds per inch spring. So what does that mean? A 500 uh, coil spring rate means that for one inch of stroke that you compress the shock, for each one inch you have to add 500 uh, pounds of force. That means that to compress two inches you need 1000 pounds of force. So, converting this graph to metric units, um, to compress the, the shock, which is a, a 57 millimeters shock, you need uh, 500 kilograms of weight to compress the shock. So, as, as I told you in the first video, the fundamentals, um, the rear suspension, the force of the rear suspension, is a ratio between the force of the shock divided by the leverage ratio. So, for the first bike, which was a linear bike, the leverage ratio is constant, is, is always 3. So, in this case, it's pretty easy because you just need to divide uh, the values of, of, the, of this, this graph, of the coil shock, you just need to divide by 3. You will have something like this. So, this is the, the forces to compress the suspension of the bike, not the shock. In this case, it's of the bike. So, as you can see, the graph is a line, which means that it's a linear bike. And to, com to bottom out this, this bike, you will need something like 170 kilograms of force on the rear wheel. Now we will analyze the, the bike B, the case of the progressive bike. Remember that bo both bikes uh, have the same travel and the same uh, shock stroke. The, the only difference is the, the variation of leverage ratio along the travel. So in this, in this case, in the, the, the case of the progressive bike, uh, we, w we will divide the, the values, the graph of the coil shock, and we will divide by the leverage ratio. So the initial, the initial values will be divided by 4, and the final values will be divided by 2. By doing the graphs, we'll, we will end up with something like this. So this is a progressive, progressive curve. In this graph, we can see that to bottom out this, this progressive bike, you will need 250 uh, kilograms of force at the, at the rear wheel. So comparing the both graphs, the linear and the progressive, uh, 
both bikes with the, sh the same um, spring rate we can see that in the progressive bike you need more uh, 20 50 percent of force to bottom out when comparing to the linear bike moreover we also see difference in the beginning of the travel zooming the this this part of the graph we can see that uh, for the same force applied to the rear wheel um, you will compress more suspension in the progressive bike comparing to the linear bike so it is a 50, uh, around 50 to 20 percent of difference this means that uh, the bike is more sensitive to small bumps and also you will have some difference in sag and I will explain you why so imagine a bike with a rider um, the weight distribution of the rider is something like 65% at the rear wheel and 35% at the front wheel so for a 70 kilograms rider 155 pounds rider you will uh, end up with a 45 uh, kilograms of weight of force at the rear wheel and 25 at the front wheel so these 45 kilograms of force if you look into the graph uh, it means that in this example for this shock in the linear bike you will compress 45 millimeters of stroke of stroke of, of travel while in the progressive bike you will compress 52 millimeters of travel that seems not to be quite a difference but in fact uh, this means that for the the same rider with this coil you will end up with a 26 percent uh, sag in the linear bike and a 30 percent sag in the progressive bike this means that uh, in the progressive bike you can run 20 percent uh, around around 20% higher spring rate or shock pressure to compensate and they have the same the same sag as in the linear bike and and if you do so that means that we, it will be even harder to bottom out the progressive bike so in this graph i change the i change the spring rates of I increase the spring rate of the progressive bike in order to normalize the sag so now we have the same sag in both bikes but as a consequence you will end up with extreme progressive curve and you will need more 80% of force to bottom out the progressive bike when comparing to the um, linear bike so you can do uh, drops twice as big in this progressive bike without bottoming out just for curiosity now i just put here the a graph for the regressive bike and as you can see it's completely the opposite of the the progressive the progressive one so at the beginning of the travel it's harder to compress the regressive bike and as the travel ends up it's become easier and easier to compress the regressive bike if you decrease the spring rate of the regressive bike in order to normalize the sag you, you will in, end up with a very easy to bottom out bike so there is no big advantages in regressive bikes at least for um, an enduro or downwheel application probably for a cross country application uh, where the riders want a firmer suspension at the beginning and easy to bottom out suspension probably for uh, cross country applications it's a good a good design but quite honestly i don't i don't like it i prefer the the progressive one and uh, that's it that's the end of the video i hope you you enjoy and learn and learn more so about leverage ratios and forces of the suspension please check my previous videos to learn more more things and subscribe to my channels to to see the future videos 
So bye people, see you next time.